Good day from Washington, DC. And I'd like to extend a warm welcome from the Africa Center to our alumni, colleagues, and partners from nearly 50 countries across the African continent and beyond who have joined us for today's webinar entitled The Cyber Dimensions of Statecraft in Africa. My name is Nate Allen, and I am the Assistant Professor of Security Studies here at the Africa Center. And I'm the faculty lead on cyber issues. This webinar is the second in a series of quarterly webinars we will be hosting to understand how information technology is influencing the African continent's security threats and challenges. Before we continue the program, I'd like to briefly turn things over to Kate almquist kanaf the director of the Africa Center, to say a few words. Kate, over to you. Well, thank you, Dr. Allen, and uh, welcome to the Africa Center's alumni, distinguished colleagues, and friends. Thank you so much for joining us for this program today. The Africa Center serves as a forum for research, academic programs, and the exchange of ideas with the aim of enhancing citizen security by strengthening the effectiveness and accountability of African institutions. We are a Department of Defense Regional Center located at the National Defense University in Washington, DC. We carry out our mission of advancing African security by expanding understanding, providing a trusted platform for dialogue, building enduring partnerships, and catalyzing strategic solutions. Accordingly, we seek to generate relevant insight and analysis that informs practitioners and policymakers on topical and emerging security trends and on effective responses to dynamic and complex security challenges. Recognizing that addressing these serious challenges can only come about through candid and thoughtful exchanges, the Africa Center provides opportunities for partners to exchange views on shared interests and sound practices. By engaging with our African partners, military and civilian, governmental and civil society, as well as national and regional, we hope to reinforce that we all have valuable roles to play in mitigating the complex drivers of conflict and insecurity on the continent today through enduring and capable institutions. This kind of dialogue infused with real world experiences and fresh analysis such as we'll hear today, we hope provides an opportunity for continued learning and catalyzes concrete actions. So thank you once again for joining us today for this conversation on cyber dimensions of statecraft. I look forward to the discussion and to thank the panel in advance for their contributions. Back to you, Nate. Thank you very much, Kate. So, to remind everyone, in our, in our previous webinar, we discussed broadly how cyber issues were beginning to influence the African national security landscape. And we established during that webinar, as well as during in some readings that we linked for this webinar today, that there are at least four national security challenges broadly that African security actors and African actors ought to be concerned about as a result of the continent's digitization. Um, first, we have espionage or the penetration of adversarial systems primarily to collect information. Um, second, we have critical infrastructure sabotage or the use of malware to disable or destroy critical information systems and infrastructure in sectors such as banking, energy, telecommunications, health, uh, government, and the armed forces. Um, uh, third, we have organized crime or the use of information technology to perpetuate or enable fraud, theft, or other organized criminal activity. And then finally, we have fourth combat innovation or the use of sensors, electronic warfare, drones, and other emerging technologies in combat. Um, in addition to these threats, uh, concerns over African reliance on foreign companies and governments to supply critical information infrastructure and technology was raised as a key concern during uh, last, the webinar last time. And I'm sure it's a topic that we're gonna return to today. Um, so where last time we focused primarily on the threats very broadly, in today's discussion, we're gonna to begin to unpack how these threats map on to various security sector actors. Um, and in this seminar in particular, we're gonna discuss the cyber challenges and threats posed by state actors. And I think this is an important, albeit somewhat poorly understood topic uh, for a number of reasons. Um, so first, uh, though it's true that the private sector is the principal source of innovation in human capital in the information and technology sectors, um, states are easily the most powerful offensive actors in cyberspace. They are referred to by the cyber community at times as advanced persistent threats, and they've conducted the most sophisticated 
attacks we've seen to date. Um, and some of them, such as the WannaCry ransomware attack, which was sponsored by North Korea, have affected African countries. Um, few actors can match the state resources of state actors. In addition, state actors possess legal and regulatory authorities that put them in a privileged position vis-a-vis -vis non state actors. Um, second, uh, because digital technology is often cheap and widely available, um, we're seeing capabilities in surveillance and espionage, artificial intelligence, and automation, autonomous weapons, rapidly diffusing. Um, over a dozen African armed forces that we know about um, have acquired military drones over the past 20 years or so, and another 15 possess advanced artificial intelligence-enabled surveillance capabilities, which, as many cyber experts can tell you, are, are potentially capable of being, being repurposed uh, for espionage. Um, today, uh, and this is just the beginning I'd like to add, um, broadband in particular, uh, as it diffuses across the African continent, is gonna increase both the connectivity and vulnerability of African states to state-sponsored cyber threats from foreign actors external to Africa, but also potentially to other African states. Um, so today we're going to deepen our understanding by discussing the challenges African states face from state-sponsored cyber threats. And we have two learning objectives from today's webinar. Um, first, we want to understand our expanding of how the spread of digital technology is influencing covert action and covert statecraft in Africa through the kinds of activities I just described. And then second, we want to expand understanding of how digital technology is being incorporated into uh, battlefield strategies, operations, and tactics by African armed forces. And to help us achieve these objectives, we have assembled a diverse panel of experts, practitioners, and analysts with decades of collective experience uh, implementing and analyzing uh, ICT policy and strategy across Africa. You have access to their biographies, so I'm going to keep my introductions brief. Um, first, we have Mr. Kenneth Adu Amanfo who is the executive director of the Africa Cybersecurity and Digital Rights Organization, which conducts cybersecurity strategy, policy, and capacity building for governments, nonprofits, and enterprises. Um, he was formerly the director of IT and cybersecurity for the Ghana National Communications Authority, where he co-facilitated the development of Ghana's national cybersecurity policy and strategy, helped establish the cybersecurity division and served as the cybersecurity lead for the US Ghana Security Governance Initiative. He is also a lecturer uh, at the University of Ghana and head of the ACDRO Cyber Academy. Next, we have Ms. Grace Gathaiga, who is the convener of the Kenya ICT Action Network, which is a multi-stakeholder platform that works closely with governments, the social security sector, civil society, and experts to inform ICT policy and regulations in Kenya. Uh, she is also the host of Take on Tech, which is a weekly television talk show hosted by the Kenya National Broadcaster, the Kenya Broadcasting Corporation. And finally, we have uh, Dr. Gerard uh, Lerouillon Ayum Ayum. He is an expert in cyber criminality and cyber intelligence and the CEO and founder of CyberX, uh, a cyber defense consultancy based in Cameroon. He has also recently founded the African Center for Strategic Cyber Research, a think tank uh, that aims to generate increased interest from policymakers and industry, leads, industry leaders on cyber defense issues. So now let's, let's get into questions. We'll begin uh, with you, uh, Dr. Ayum. Um, cyber experts and analysts are in general agreement that cyber tools and techniques are transforming the practices of covert action and coercive statecraft. One analyst, Ben Buchanan, who I think put it particularly nicely, refers to cyber capabilities as a low grade but persistent part of geopolitical competition. And I'd, I'd like you to unpack for our audience how this is the case. How is the spread of information technology influencing coercive statecraft? And what kinds of intelligence collection or capabilities to compromise critical infrastructure do some states have that they might not have possessed before? Uh, Dr. Ayum, the, the, floor, the floor is yours. Thank you for giving me the floor. I would like to mention precisely that in terms of uh, the impact of uh, uh, cyber threats can be seen at the governmental level, but also at the level of civilian 
actions because uh, the uh, digitalization in Africa means that there is a new uh, modus operandi. But this is also true in terms of intelligence gathering because in reality, what we need to note is that there are different um, security services that are becoming better, but they are not the only ones to become better. So there is another threat such as um, cyber crime because they are getting better as well. So there is a sort of race uh, between governmental actions and other threats. So there are different types of threats. There is a cyber crime, cyber terrorism. And so what we uh, realized is that in order to become updated, uh, states invest in the acquisition of drones, air drones, but also um, ground drones. Because what we need to understand is that climate in Africa does not allow the protection of certain borders. And so there are certain areas that can only be protected um, with uh, ground drones, but acquiring drones is also an issue in terms of specialties, because, for example, a West African country acquired drones but could not use them because they could not uh, see at night. And so when there was an attack, they realized that the drone could not be used. There are other threats which is the APTs, so the persistent threats with uh, malware that are attached to systems and intrude into the systems in order to get information on uh, certain networks. These malware gather information and remain hidden for years without anybody uh, realizing it. In terms of intelligence gathering, most of the information that is acquired is acquired by open source networks. And what we realize is that even uh, sur surveillance methods have become automatic. Many terrorist operations or threats to security uh, start with uh, social networks. And so at this time, it is important to do surveillance in social networks so that we can analyze those cyber cells and identify them because they work asymmetrically. They can be related to governments, but in fact, they are present in social networks. And so we need to understand what is happening in terms of propaganda, because it can uh, be a threat in terms of freedom and security, etc. That's what I have to say. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Au. Um, so I'd, I'd like to take Dr. Aim's response Merci around de, de, around some of the technology and tactics and focus more specifically on the African topic, on context. Um, we're going to go to you. Uh, Mr. Amonfo, from your perspective, kind of based on the conversations you've had in your current role, as well as a public servant in Ghana, um, how vulnerable are African states to, to state-sponsored espionage or critical infrastructure sabotage using some of the techniques, the sophisticated malware, even, you know, I think as, as Dr. Laura nicely noted, often it's, it's open source intelligence or, or publicly available information in social networks. Um, how, how vulnerable are African states to these types of methods and tactics? And would you say the risks are primarily uh, internal uh, from other African states or, or external from, from foreign countries? Um, thanks, Nate, for the introduction um, and also to the African Center for Strategic um, Studies team for having me um, as a panelist. Um, good morning, good afternoon to our cherished uh, participants. Um, thanks. I think African states are highly vulnerable to state-sponsored espionage and, and the threat of digital sabotage to the critical national infrastructures. And I believe that this high probability is as a result of African states shifting priority on the, um, their digitization of government services and critical national information 
uh, infrastructures in line with the African Union Digital Transformation Strategy for 2020 and 2022 as a driving force for innovation, inclusion, and sustainable growth in contributing to the achievement of the UN uh, 2026. So most African nations are trying, are embarking on this digital transformation um, to promote you know, the well-being of their citizens and also to promote their governance systems. Um, of recent years, we have seen the national security, uh, defense organizations or institutions and the intelligence agencies embracing digital technologies for the security intelligence operations, um, such as the establi establishment of digital command center, um, which, which command and control center, which um, is evident in Ghana. And um, most countries are also setting up intelligence fusion centers to aid them in sharing intelligence among their uh, intelligence agencies and, and, and stakeholders. All this, I believe that all these government systems and critical national information systems are easy targets for state-sponsored espionage and the threat of digital sab sabotage, um, such as a denial of service attacks and uh, stealing in, in, of information. It is important to state here that the challenge of, of, of uh, this challenge or this rise in, 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 in um, espionage attacks and, and all that is due to the lack of funding and lack of uh, technical expertise within the African African states. So these organizations or these governments tend up to uh, seek funding and support from uh, external donors who comes in to build their infrastructures for them, to build their intelligence infrastructure, to build their defense infrastructure, digital infrastructures, I mean. And, and they come, they do not only come to provide infrastructure and go. Number two, they come also with their expertise. Since we lack, as an, within the African region, they, we lack the expertise in digital technology. So they come uh, to install these uh, infrastructures and um, bring their expertise. Number one, the infrastructures uh, comes with pre-installed malware, pre-installed uh, spywares and backdoors. You know that aids them in gathering, you know, transmitting information, intelligence information across to them. Um, it also comes with, you know, uh, malwares or softwares that enable them to even spy on your activities. Um, unfortunately, um, Ghana, these donors just come and then they do not provide expert training or, or after the installation, they don't even provide skill set training for the local team to be able to manage. So we are we are locked up in depending on them for years to support this, this infrastructure. And I believe these are all vulnerable areas that, you know, that gives them access, you know, to launch their espionage attacks and also, you know, attacks on our critical na national infrastructures. Let me just focus, let me, let me zero into the national cyber security. Um, in the national cybersecurity governments are implementing, they have set up their national cybersecurity centers or agencies or authorities and have developed their policies and strategies that they are implementing. And one of the key pillars in this, in this um, uh, strategy is the setup of the computer emergency response teams or the computer emergency incident response teams. These are supposed to be the, the, the center that implements the controls and all that to protect the country, to protect African countries from, you know, all these external attacks. But this organize, these are the institutions also depend on external donors to provide the funding for them and they don't have the funding. So they come and then set the infrastructure. So these are the infrastructure that is supposed to monitor all government critical infrastructures and, and identify the threats and, and, and either proactively resolve them or you know, pass intelligence information. Now, if these systems already are embedded with malwares and spywares and, 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 and botnets and, and what have you, then we, the, the, this, the African countries, I can say that we are at risk. So, so these this are very, very critical. But let me conclude by saying that state-sponsored attacks 
on African states are predominantly from external actors, from, um, from financial, due to financial gains or stealing in intelligence information or sabotage of our critical national infrastructures. For example, um, in January 2021, um, it was there were hackers that were linked to Hezbollah. Breach telecom were found to breach the telecom company's infrastructure and the internet service infra infrastructures. Uh, um, um, this were not just focused on Africa, but it, it was an attack that was targeted to the US, the UK, Israel, Lebanon, and all that. But amazingly, Egypt was part of this, 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 this attack, this Hezbollah attacks. In December 2020, uh, there was another uh, Facebook uh, attack. The Facebook was found that two groups of Russians, one group from the uh, from individuals affiliated with French military, were using fake Facebook accounts to conduct political information, you know, gathering in Africa, and and this cut across so many countries. But I must say that there are a lot of African. Um, recently, there was a Microsoft. Uh, a breach in Microsoft vulnerability, uh, you know, that they, they exploited. Africans are also using this Microsoft uh, uh, softwares and applications and, and software. So if there are vulnerabilities and the vulnerabilities are extorted, it affects the Africans. But unfortunately, we do not, in Africa, we do not have the expertise and the tools to monitor and identify. So if these vulnerabilities are not announced and, um, the patches or resolutions are passed on for us to implement, then we, we sit there. So you can imagine how long, um, you know, we have spywares from external actors that are monitoring our intelligence and extorting confidential information, transmitting them outside the African continent for years that we don't even know, know of. Um, but for the past few years, external have external you know actors or external attacks have shifted also onto the region we have seen attacks you know within within regions within nations um, a typical example is the Boko Haram attack on the Nigerian secret service leaking personal records of more than 60 60 past and current spies um, um, from a domestic spy agency um, and another attack that also focus on nation to nation attack uh, within the African states. A typical example is the, the recent Egypt's cyber attack on the Ethiopian company over the dispute on the ground it, it, Ethiopian regional, um, re, renaissance dam across the, the, the so, so the attacks are, are, are varied. They are both external and they are both from external actors and also within the African region. So even though the external actors are more, it gradually the internal and within the regional attacks is 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 becoming is moving on the on the increase. Um, so I want to end it up here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, I think you made it really clear how you know African states in particular, at both at once, need capabilities and are are rapidly developing cyber capabilities, but are also pretty dependent on foreign actors for those capabilities, which exposes them to lots and lots of risk. So. Next question is going to go to you, Panamis Kathaga. You have a pretty unique perspective as someone who works closely with both government and civil society actors on ICT issues. So I'd like you to kind of elaborate a little bit on how to respond to some of these threats and challenges that our colleagues identified above. What can African states do individually or collectively to mitigate some of these risks in espionage or, or critical protect their critical national infrastructure from state-sponsored cyber threats? Grace, over to you. Uh, thanks so much, uh, even for inviting me to be one of the speakers this, af this afternoon. It's afternoon in Nairobi. And um, I want to say that I agree with what the two speakers have said and pick it from where uh, Kenneth has, has ended uh, in just looking at uh, what strategies um, uh, that African states can actually use to mitigate uh, espionage uh, risks. And uh, as I give these perspectives, they, you know, these strategies can actually be used within states or even in a state uh, internally, uh, since we have different stakeholders 
who need um, uh, to participate. And I must also mention that, uh, you know, Kitnet uh, is a multi-stakeholder platform. And so we work with different stakeholders and therefore my, my views are also informed um, by that multi-stakeholderism. So just to pick it from where Ken, Ken left, I think Ken, uh, mentioned the the the, the bit about um, espionage and um, and the fact that uh, you know Africa has actually deployed foreign technology. Um, the devices we use, the phones we use, they are all uh, foreign. And I think what Ken Dean mentioned is that there was a rumor, which we didn't uh, want to, I guess, to pursue about uh, you know surveillance, I mean, the, the equipment installed at the AUC uh, having um, surveillance uh, technology embedded in them. And when you think that that is where the African leaders meet, that is where we all meet when we want to come up with uh, strategies for this continent, then it really, uh, you know, gives, um, leaves a lot to be desired, uh, because then it means that there's nothing you can discuss that is, um, you know, that remains in Africa. It then means that it's being recorded somewhere. So, you know, what does this, um, you know, because then Africa doesn't have its own foreign techno, you know, uh, technology doesn't have its own devices. What does this lack of know-how then portend for the continent, especially in, in times uh, of, of cyber attack? and how can states deal with risks, uh, risks of espionage? Uh, I want to say that one, one area that states need to focus on is capacity building. And I know Ken alluded to that, but I want to elaborate and say that um, to develop the skills, it is important to develop the skills human resources and, and uh, not just human resources, but also policies and institutions that, um, that will serve in increasing the resilience and security of states um, in order for them to fully, you know, in order for states to fully enjoy the benefits of digital technologies. So there's need to build expertise across a range of diplomatic, across a range of legal, policy, legislative, and even uh, regulatory areas. Uh, in terms of tech deployment, again, this is an area of capacity building, one of it, is that Africa has then ended up uh, being the competition uh, continent for foreign companies when it comes to tech deployment. Um, and so with this, there's need to actually build local capacity in such areas as tech, development so that uh, then Africans also have information uh, on what tech works for them and then what sort of policies would support the development of this tech. Um, whether then there is a right law that supports for Africa say to go for local uh, technology as opposed to foreign technology. And basically then invest in cyber measures that are actually local in nature and can deal with Africa, um, you know, with Africa issues. So that means that Africa needs to be able to reset. Uh, another area of capacity building, of course, is in training. Um, training for its diplomats. Uh, I have seen, I have been in meetings where negotiations are taking place. Uh, and I can see other teams are so organized. Uh, they have brought expertise um, in the different areas in cyber capacity, but you find that the Africa team might have just one or two people dealing with all the issues that are um, under discussion. And so um, in such areas, uh, in terms of training, I think there's need to build the capacity uh, so that whoever then is negotiating um, is, is conversant with what sort of communication channels, um, you know, work in terms of, uh, you know, scenario-based exercises, because the, the, the experienced teams, you can already see they had scenarios where they played uh, out what, what the discussions would be. And then, of course, um, 
there's also um, the need also to have our SATs actually also trained uh, in, in part of these negotiations because they also find themselves in, uh, in, in these sort of exchanges. And uh, so it would be beneficial to them to be able to articulate uh, what Africa stands for, especially in terms of uh, cyber, cyber uh, threats. Now, another area still in capacity building is that there's need to, for especially for governments, to embrace multi-stakeholderism. There's need to have a multi-stakeholder approach when it comes to addressing, uh, especially technical and policy gaps in cyber, uh, in cyber areas. And uh, as, as we also think of multi-stakeholderism, I think it's very important also to address uh, the gender equality and meaningful, what meaningful participation of women is all about in cyber threats discussions, as well as in capacity building programs uh, um, and international security, including having specific gender disaggregated data on how women are participating in this. So African states need to look at capacity building as an enabler for all states to contribute uh, to increased stability and security globally. And therefore need, like Ken says, they need to resource capacity building with human as well as financial means. Now, the second area um, that I want to talk about is quickly on innovation. Now, Africa does not have a lot of, um, you know, has, has not demonstrated um, the, the, that it is innovative and that it is coming up with, with uh, um, technologies that can deal with cyber, uh, cyber um, issues. And so um, when then it comes to African states trying to regulate uh, what is in existence. Sometimes they have their hands, um, you know, tied because the technology deployed is foreign as well as the devices in use. And so all, all supply chains are actually foreign. So what African states need to do is to set aside and encourage innovation so that we start manufacturing and they also start investing in own technology. I think uh, it's very important to collect, uh, I mean, to correct this imbalance um, or else this continent uh, will continue holding uh, the, the, the short end of digital divide. I think there's also need to encourage a responsible state behavior. Uh, and this is to address existing and potential threats where a responsible state behavior in use of digital tools or in use of ICTs uh, need um, to, 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 to be an area of concern. Um, we have our private sector deploying the technology, but really what is their responsibility? What is their responsibility when that infrastructure is installed? I think there needs to be very clear uh, internally and among states in particular on infrastructure that especially goes across the border where states should aim to maintain peace and security as well as promote uh, human rights. Um, and um, then there's the element of confidence building where uh, this needs to be fostered. Uh, you know, there, there needs to be transparency among the states and cooperation, um, you know, to reduce uh, the risk of, 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 of conflicts uh, in the cyberspace. Uh, so this is about addressing mistrust that might uh, probably uh, arise from misunderstanding uh, between states uh, and this can be, you know, confidence building can be through um, regular meetings, establishment of communication uh, channels, building bridges and initiating, um, initiating uh, cooperation on shared objectives. Uh, of mutual uh, interest. So part of confidence building uh, would be probably to establish national uh, points uh, of contacts uh, as a measure for implementation of may many or several other confidence building measures and states could identify or consider this as 
uh, you know, in their appropriate context, what can they do and what can they do so that they also have their own limits that um, they have defined, uh, but at least there are ways of cooperating with other states on behalf, um, you know, of, of, of implementation. And I think uh, um, there's, there's already uh, discussions on going at the open-ended working group uh, on, on, on uh, issues of uh, confidence building. And I think also very important, I don't know whether it's uh, Ken who mentioned or the professor, this need to have collaboration collaboration internally, you know, among states, because for example, the East Africa region, you know, there are many areas of, uh, you know, that we have commonalities. So, you know, we can collaborate in those areas. Uh, internally, we have different arms, um, you know, some government, some private, all dealing with, uh, with cybersecurity issues. And I think um, it's, it's, it's important to, it, you know, collaboration would enhance measures to mitigate risks in dealing with, uh, you know, with threats um, in, in, in our cyberspace. And um, I think uh, within that, uh, it would also be good to share good practices and norms, uh, especially on how a country that has been successful in dealing with cyber attacks has handled that. And uh, that calls for regular dialogue, um, sharing of information, um, exchanging information on some of the existing threats, uh, some of the national policy and legislative frameworks, what dialogues have worked. And this should also be a practice internally within state among the arms that are dealing with that, where stakeholders um, then have an open dialogue to, be, to debate these concerns. And uh, it, the, the thing is, um, there's no need of treating cybersecurity as, as, a, as a military or a securitization issue because um, you know it should be looked at on as a multi-stakeholder uh, issue that then requires multi-sectoral approach to deal with that. And um, I think uh, collectively African states should consider having a regular institutional dialogue among themselves and maybe through the African Union. Hey, hey, Grace, th th thank you so much. I, I want to, we have another round of questions. And so okay. we're, we're getting, running some low on time. So I'd like to, I'd like to move on. I've and actually, encourage... ended, I've actually finished. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. All, all, all three of our, our panelists to keep this, this next round of, of responses somewhat brief. So we have some time to engage with our audience. Um, but, but thank you for that wonderfully comprehensive uh, answer. Um, that, that was really, really, really well done, especially the, the point around gender issues, which I think is, is often neglected both in debates around security issues and cybersecurity issues. So thanks for, for mentioning uh, gender. So I'd like to move the discussion now from how information technology is being used as a tool to, of coercive statecraft to a direct discussion of its strategic and military applications. And this topic hasn't been much discussed, but I think it's becoming clear that as, as you, you alluded to earlier, uh, Dr. Leroy Andrade, that, that cyber capabilities, drones, sensors, and artificial intelligence are increasingly being incorporated into the military strategies and tactics of armies across the world. And I'd like to ask you uh, to comment on how you see these emerging technologies making their way into the security forces of, of African, African states, both in Cameroon or, or, or elsewhere. So uh, Dr. Leroy, the floor is yours. Yes, of course. Thank you for giving me the floor again. What we should note is that in the military, yes, they are incorporated because most countries right now are starting to work on cyber defense policies. So we are starting to wonder uh, how we can address these uh, digital issues. So each country is starting to use uh, critical infrastructures that exist. We are starting to try and understand how we can protect those infrastructures. But first, there used to be a problem in Africa. The problem was that people didn't have a culture of information protection. But as we come along, we realize that in terms of warfare, information is a critical um, 
a critical need, protection of information, rather. Uh, recently, there was an issue in terms of information protection within an African state, and it created a risk, and it almost destabilized the uh, governing power. So the military understand now that we need to work on that issue. Somebody mentioned it. We are dependent in terms of knowledge and technology, and so this creates a uh, climate in which we are inferior uh, militarily. So in Africa, in West Africa, I uh, saw a very delicate situation. Uh, there was somebody who wanted to sell a drone and he knew that the uh, chief of staff uh, didn't really understand drones. So he was presenting uh, civilian drones to him uh, for military operations. So when they tested it, people realized that the signals from the drones could not be detected. And so it was easy to place yourself between the operator of the drone and the drone and to inject commands that would uh, uh, mess up the command of the drone. And so it uh, meant that the drone could not function properly. So what we need to understand is that states nowadays are starting to wonder about critical questions. And several states are setting up a new uh, cyber war uh, structure, cyber warfare structures with security cooperation centers that didn't exist in the past. So we need to know that many African countries didn't have such centers for uh, cyber security. In terms of cyber warfare, we know that in terms of whether it is offensive or defensive uh, cyber defense, we don't have enough tools to truly uh, fight. Now, this is not a good situation, but many countries actually um, shut off the power. Some youth got signals from planes and were speaking in, you know, for the air uh, traffic controller. And so this can happen. Uh, communication can be intercepted. This means that they can actually create a plane crash. So many countries started buying radars. Many African countries did not have them to follow uh, what was happening in the airspace. So in terms of warfare, what we realize is that many countries can see operations uh, being carried out using WhatsApp and so forth. So there are true vulnerabilities. The signals can be intercepted. So whatever is human can actually be deciphered. So states are now setting up a cyber task force. Now those cyber task forces, are they actually uh, appropriate? Well, not necessarily. And this is why many of our countries end up with information that comes from outside of the country, which is a real danger. In some countries, even ID cards are um, delivered by outside uh, actors that belong to Western companies. Communication antennas are set up by companies that belong to Western uh, companies. So even when you uh, set up in Africa units or measures in order to respond to the cyber tool as a uh, military tool, the problem is that today, uh, those who command in terms of strategy do not truly understand the cyber tool. Many uh, generals uh, are not uh, trained. They don't really understand uh, the cyberspace. And so there is that whole issue, the issue of orientation. The African militaries are trained overseas. And when they come back and no 
enough about warfare and uh, politics, they come back to Cameroon or Senegal or Chad or wherever it is in South Africa, they don't necessarily work in a unit that is related to what they actually learn. They are just wherever they might be working in transmissions or uh, they might be uh, working on a ship and yet they have been trained in warfare. So what I think is that there was a study that was done on the analysis of security policies. And what we realized is that 80% of uh, security policies of African countries had been inspired by uh, businesses, security policies, foreign businesses uh, policies. And they were uh, the basically the copy of the security policies of other countries, but the context is not the same. Uh, crime is not the same, the threat is not the same. And so we end up with uh, cyber defense policies, cyber security policies that are not appropriate for us. So there is an issue, an issue in terms of training, an issue in terms of context of the threat or understanding of that context. There is a list of cyber crime, a list of cyber threats. And uh, so I would give you now a very simple example. Most of the countries started to practice in this domain. Therefore, it means that a lot of uh, a lot of African countries were not even able to in, uh, intercept this uh, on the practical practical level. However, the terrorist group in the region already had these cap capabilities and they they had capabilities to control everything in communication what's happening but the generation that governing now does not understand the threat and the generation that understands the threat that has the capability to react unfortunately nobody listens to them and doesn't even have uh, the right to talk. They can only uh, submit basically and obey. Thank you. That's what I had to say. Uh, thank you very much. So we're, we're beginning to run a little bit low on time and we already have lots of really great audience questions. So I'd like to encourage our audience A to begin to start uh, asking their questions and we're gonna to begin to transition to our, our question and answer session. And we're gonna do something uh, new for, for the Africa Center. We're gonna do uh, a, a couple of live polls to facilitate kind of live audience participation and hear your opinion about what you think some of the major state-based cyber threats and, and challenges um, are. So um, you will now see a live Zoom survey uh, populate your screen. Uh, you, the question asks you to select what you consider to be your country or regions most significant state-sponsored cyber threat. Uh, the questions and answers are written simultaneously in English, French, and Portuguese. Uh, please answer the question by selecting the response and clicking submit. Um, on mobile devices, if you're connected, you might have to just touch the appropriate response, which should appear highlighted. I um, mean, you can only select one response. One response. Um, we will leave this question open for about 30 more seconds, and then we're gonna go on to the second question and ask our panelists to react to, to both uh, the results of both questions. Okay, so we have surveillance is our first largest threat, um, followed by uh, critical infrastructure sabotage. Um, let's do the next question, please. We have one more live question for our audience. Could you please display that? Okay, government is number one at 50% followed by the finance sector, number two at 30%. So I'd, I'd like to uh, react, or I'll ask our panelists to react, just to remind everyone, we chose surveillance as the largest uh, state-sponsored threat in terms of the, the threat, followed by critical infrastructure sabotage, one and two, 45, I think, and 30%. And then for the, the sectors that are most vulnerable, about 50% of our respondents said the government sector followed by the finance sector at, at 33%. So let's just go to all of our panelists quickly and, and ask them to offer their, their brief 
uh, reactions. Um, Ken, why don't we go to you? Yeah, thank you, Nat. Yeah, so um, for the sectors most vulnerable, um, what they chose government as the first and, and the finance as the second. Yeah, I, will, I, will, I, I do agree with, um, with a government that I would have, um, I would have gone for the um, um, the military uh, as the first. Why do I say military as the first? Because military is supposed to be the gateway of every state. They are supposed to fight a sterner, you know, inflow. So once you break the military intelligence, once you break the military power, you you basically have control control of government. So I believe that the military is supposed to, is the risks at, towards the military, I believe is a, of a high priority. And then from there, then you come to government because government runs the system without, when the, if government goes down, the whole uh, economy goes down. And when we are talking about government in terms of cyber, we are talking about the government critical national infrastructures. We are talking about the SCADA systems for the, wat the water, the SCADA system for power. If the entire power is shut down, the whole economy is is out. It goes it goes on blackout, and and water. So I, I believe uh, government services are very important. The health, the water, the electricity. So if it goes, if they are able to attack the government, bring government down, it, it, will, it will also be. And then before it goes to the financial, most financial institutions are being attacked. The banks are being attacked, and and it doesn't really affect the nation or the state because they don't even come out to tell us about it until we, we get in know. So I'll go for the military first and then followed by government. I think, uh, I, think I want to, for me, critical infrastructure uh, is important because it may include, uh, and, and I'm giving an example from my country because now we're already on that, you know, it may include medical facilities, it may include financial services, it may include water, it's, you know, and, and electricity, it may include power, it may include transport, it may include sanitization, and therefore malicious uh, attack on critical infrastructure for me can undermine trust and confidence, um, you know, in, in, in any country, in, in any political situation, uh, can undermine public institutions and uh, the impact can actually um, um, have, you know, can, can impact negatively on the integrity of the country and even the internet. And so uh, attack on such systems, um, you know, including say infrastructure and financial, like our MPSA could actually uh, portend danger because most of our financial systems are now connected to the MPSA uh, system and therefore disrupting uh, or attacking that as a critical infrastructure would end up disrupting uh, systems and how things are done. So, you know, for me, this is, this is dangerous and needs to be protected. What I have to say is that for me, the main threat is uh, espionage and the uh, financial sector. Why? why do we spy to have uh, in order to have operational information that we will use to get the data and extract the information that will allow us either to hack a system or to have uh, offensive actions on the economic level which would allow us to disrupt big government societies or banks i would like to remind you that today in africa there are a lot of countries that do not possess a bank system. The big question, a lot of, at least uh, local ones, a lot of African countries do not have banks, but they don't even have a presence in the strategic area. It is a gift to be able to get information, spy on the economic environment and take advantage on the financial level, for example. Some uh, espionage operations allowed for the overtaking of big national uh, societies. I think that a lot of operations in Africa are not directly on the military level because today, nobody, 
nobody wants to disrupt a whole country, but most espionage operations are alternate war, for example, being able to control a population on the psychological level. And so we need to know it, which is why we're talking about espionage. You can control a country by disrupting companies in key sectors and by controlling these companies or corporations or institutions, you're gonna create an environment where you can control even the authorities of the country because we are in charge of the economy, complete charge of the economy of the country. Today, espionage, when it is practiced in, uh, at the country level, the object is, is gray, no longer black and white. We do not want to destroy a country, but we want to use the uh, software of these countries to control them. Today, Africa has has environments that are controlled by external agents because they have the critical information. Because when it comes to control an individual, you have mice. And by having this information on Africa centers, the executives of uh, African corporations we were able to submit them and force them either to sell their company or to obey uh, uh, instructions that do not have their best interests at heart. So whether it comes to trade wars or something else, but the biggest threat today for African countries is to be able to control critical information, confidential information and useful information to protect their financial assets. Otherwise, they can be working for other people. That's my my uh, advice. All right. Thank you very, very much for those three really thoughtful responses. So I'm going to go through uh, a bunch of our audience questions, and then we'll go through one more round of kind of follow up from the three of you. So just just listen and kind of pick and choose which questions you would like to answer. You obviously don't have to answer uh, all of them. So. One question we have is the threats faced by African countries differ from one another. Um, nevertheless, there are some threats like uh, uh, transnational crimes perpetuated using funding from the dark web, arms trafficking or, or drug sales. Um, and and they, they, the, the, the question is, is there any known body perhaps under the African Union or otherwise that helps coordinate the activities of various cyber defense units of various African countries to kind of confront these transnational threats? Um, a second uh, question we have is, is one way to potential deal with some cyber related vulnerabilities is to rely potentially on open source software um, where maybe the vulnerabilities are more transparent. Um, a third question, and this we saw this on the chat, uh, relates to uh, maritime cybersecurity. Um, so what are, what are the threats related to maritime cybersecurity, infrastructure and shipping? I know there's been a significant degree of attention on that, particularly over the past couple of years. Um, a, a fourth question is, um, you know, prioritizing cybersecurity in Africa has been a challenge. Um, there's a lack of funding, political will, and interest that, that I think all three of our, pi our panelists to various degrees highlighted. Um, but there are also issues like hunger, armed conflict, and disease, which to some degree is pushing cybersecurity um, back on the list. So the question is, um, particularly for Grace, but also for other panelists, is without the securitization of cybersecurity, as, as, as Grace suggests, how, how do you get the necessary political will and commitment required to put cybersecurity at, at the top of the agenda? Um, and a few more questions. So next we have a, a general question. Maybe you can, you can formulate your answers into, the, into, into some of the other answers. Is what's the most urgent action do you feel African states need to do to improve their cybersecurity and defense. And um, next, um, what another another question that we have is what is the Global Commission on Cyber Stability? Um, what connections does it have with other African states? I think Great might Grace might have served or consulted on it, so that would be potentially a good a good question for her to answer. Um, questions on on a couple of questions on drones. Um, uh, a little bit skeptical on there's a little skepticism on their efficiency questions about whether they can be used at night 
Um, are they really going to be a kind of a, a potentially uh, a game changing capability or should we really be that concerned about drones, I think is the gist of, of some of these, these questions. Um, and next, um, a question on the impact of, of cyber threats on, on uh, radicalization in Africa. So how are cyber threats potentially causing, uh, I guess, individuals to, to radicalize? So those are, those are, the, those are the questions. Uh, feel free to hear your answers. I think by the time we're, we're done, it'll be, it'll be time to conclude, but we might be able to sneak one, one more round or one or two more questions in. So uh, this time, let's start with you, with you, Grace. Wait, wait, wait. Okay, I'm just going to pick. I think uh, there's uh, there's a question that was specifically asked to me about um, prioritizing uh, cybersecurity. You know, in the midst of all the issues that Africa faces, then how do we make uh, cybersecurity uh, a priority? And uh, my answer will just be uh, very whatever, very. Um, uh, simple because I think that's what's happening. And number one, uh, I think there's need to just create that awareness, to raise that awareness, uh, um, uh, you know, among states and um, and uh, within within the government uh, on on why it is important to protect our cyberspace, on why it is important to protect our, our infrastructure. Because when you look at most uh, governments, when they talk about critical infrastructure, they talk about water, they talk about electricity, nobody talks about our fiber, nobody talks about our internet. And I think uh, maybe like what civil society does is to start raising awareness and to point out that cybersecurity, um, of course, uh, that when you put the word security, government then looks at it as, uh, you know, that protecting uh, our borders, that protection of citizens. But I think there's also the need to emphasize that cybersecurity also requires the ideas of other people, that we need to define roles and responsibilities. But at the same time, maybe government, let government know that it has the highest uh, due, you, you know, duty to actually protect the, that, that infrastructure. So, uh, you know, I think for us, uh, what we have seen here is that that word security actually has brought up, um, you know, attention to the fact that cybersecurity is actually being prioritized. And it's also to, 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 to show how embedded the digital tools are in our day-to-day -day lives and why they need to be protected. So of course, it may not be very easy, but um, you know, they, it, they, 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 there might be uh, an opportunity to actually impress the authorities on the need to take it as a, um, as, as a priority. And I'm sure many governments are taking it as a priority. Um, the second question I want to respond to is whether AU has a department for, I, you know, for cybersecurity. And I want to say that there's a general uh, I, I, there's a general ICT department that deals with digital issues. And within that, actually AU even went ahead and, um, and, and even produced um, uh, developed the AUCC uh, cyber convention that is supposed to provide the broad principles for, for states to actually uh, come up with their cyber security laws. So yes, there's something happening. And I think what needs to, to, to go on is to encourage states to also um, uh, support that and actually sign into, into the AUCC uh, cyber uh, convention that then they can, you know, each state can use to develop uh, its own cyber, its own cyber, um, its own cyber, cyber laws. Now, and finally, there's the issue of cyber threats in radicalization. I think uh, for us in this region, we have seen uh, a lot of, uh, you know, we've seen terrorism, 
we've, especially this country has suffered from uh, terrorism and we've seen terrorist groups uh, utilizing now digital tools to organize, you know, to recruit our young people, including uh, both men and, and, and women. And therefore, I, I think that's an area that cyber, um, you know, cyber security must also focus in looking at how uh, to protect the citizens and even to protect uh, the country from use by say Al Shabab on on you know on on attacking or even sending their information and I'll leave it at that. Thank you very very much, Grace. Uh, let's go to you, Gerard. Any reactions to these many questions? Merci. Uh, Thank you. I wanted to uh, bring another uh, component to the discussion. There was a question that was quite interesting. It asked what the impact is. Is the cyber uh, threat uh, capable of having an impact on the maritime realm? Well, of course. Many ships have uh, computer systems, and most of those ships do have uh, systems with um, software inside of them. And if these softwares are compromised, it can lead to very critical situations. But also when the ship has an itinerary that has been planned and that uh, its itinerary has been transmitted somewhere, for example, in the Gulf of Aden, you can end up with small terrorist groups that um, intercept those ships and they might threaten uh, some individuals. Whatever is automatic, whatever is a cyber system needs to be secure. If it is not secure, um, it is open to threats. In terms of drones, there was a question, what is the point of uh, drones? Well, drones are extremely interesting in terms of intelligence gathering. They replace other intelligence processes that we used to do, you know, with uh, uh, people uh, being there and uh, following others and so forth. But when you buy a drone, you really need to study the drone. You need to know exactly what the mission is, what uh, where the drone will be operated, the, you know, field conditions, and what is the capabilities uh, of the drones. Because, for example, if your drone is um, autonomous for 12 hours, but if your operations need to last 24 hours, well, clearly your drone will never be uh, useful to you. Also, there are drones that have a night vision that can incorporate different capabilities that make it so that you are very reactive in the field. But I think that if you acquire a drone, you need to make sure that you define your needs before you buy a drone. Not all drones match all missions or all field operations. They are very specific. In terms of radicalization, yes, cyberspace has become the main area, the main space where uh, radicalization occurs. Why? Because there are risks today for intelligence um, departments. Some cells do not belong to any mosques, do not belong to any radical group. They just went online. They became trained and radicalized online. They follow uh, instructions given to them. And they are not detected by uh, radar or uh, intelligence uh, systems. They are the lone wolves. They don't belong to any group. They cannot be profiled. And so this type of uh, terrorists have one common point. They are uh, recruited online. They find a guru that radicalizes them. And then they are in 
indoctrinated until they finally uh, commit a fatal action. Uh, Ken, please, uh, please give give your reaction to some of these questions, and the, the final the final word is yours. All right, thank you. Let me make it real brief and short. Um, with the uh, question that was asked to Grace about the prioritization of cybersecurity in the midst of all the different issues, hunger and all that, um, I, 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 what I would like to say is that most African states, as I mentioned in my presentations, are moving into uh, digitalization. So digital transformation in, in their countries, which is in line with the AU uh, strategic direction for 2020 to 2030 or so. so most organizations, most states are implementing digital agriculture, digital health, digital, almost all the sectors are being digitalized. And this makes a case for, and once you digitize them, it's computer system, it's cyber system, so they are vulnerable for attack. So this uh, it can be a case that puts cyber security ahead of all other, other issues. In my country, for instance, um, cyber security is on top of their, the president's agenda. And we have an interministerial committee that has been set to implement the national cyber security strategy and policy. And the president is the chairman of that committee with the interministerial, all the different the interior, defense, um, foreign affairs, all being part of it. So this is a case that we, we can, you know, that, that government we can use to buy and put cyber security on, on top. Uh, there was another question with the maritime issue the case of uh, what are we are what we're doing with the Mar maritime academy i think a lot of uh, states are putting importance the idea actually embarking on, on a coordinated and concerted effort getting talking about bringing you know stakeholders from the maritime from the border from from the cyber security all together to address th these issues and in my country for instance we've set up a fishing center uh, that that when you go there, you have a cybersecurity uh, uh, rep there, maritime rep there, border security rep there, the police CID red intelligence. Everybody is in there just to gather information, uh, intelligence, and then ride on spot. You know, decisions are make uh, are made. And so I believe um, this is an area that we can deal with all maritime cybersecurity issues because there is um, a concerted effort. And um, the last one is what is the priority? Somebody asked about um, what is the what is the most urgent thing that we can do in the area of implementing our national cyber security to to defend our uh, to increase defense. And um, I believe that the first thing, as Grace already aligned, is awareness creation. We need to have a national um, cyber security awareness campaign that cuts across all sectors, child, child online protection, right from the children, I mean, every sector. The awareness is the first because the human beings are the weakest link. And, and if you don't bridge that gap, then no matter how much sophisticated equipment that you put in place to defend yourself, uh, that which are going to be handled by human beings anyway. So awareness creation is key. And the second aspect is building our computer emergency response response uh, teams, which are the set, national set. And it's important to have that in place to address all cyber security, get the cyber intelligence and analyze them and pass them ahead. And, and they serve as the, as the gateway in terms of our cyber securing our, uh, our nation's cyber border. And then trickle it down to sectorial sets, having the, the, the telecom sector have their own sectorial set to address immediately address cyber security issues within the sec, have a financial sectorial set and all. So basically national sec and sectorial set, um, not to take too much of your time, thanks. No, thank you very much, uh, Ken. And thank you very much to our three panelists for for, for giving their time and for their, their excellent kind of response and discussion uh, today uh, and for, for joining us. Um, three really brief conclusions, if I may. I, I think this discussion has made really clear to me that um, there's a pretty large potential for an expansion in the vulnerabilities of African states to state-sponsored espionage and critical infrastructure sabotage as a result of expanding digitization. It, it, the more that our lives become online, the more that our critical infrastructure systems like healthcare, water, energy become cyber-dependent, um, the greater the vulnerabilities are. 
Um, and I think both uh, Gerard and Ken did a really excellent job of talking about the sensitivities involved of how most African countries right now are really dependent on foreign companies and governance to supply technology, which creates a, a huge vulnerabilities and, and risks. Um, but they're also, and I think this was made pretty clear by Ken and Gerard at varying points in their conversations, there are increasing vulnerabilities to, to state-sponsored espionage within Africa. Um, you know, I, I Ken talked about cyber commands, data fusion centers. Um, you know, what, what cyber experts will tell you is that is that capabilities that can be used in surveillance can also be used in espionage. So maybe not in the near term, but over the medium to long term, as Africa digitized, digitizes, I would expect more African countries to develop what we call uh, offensive uh, cyber capabilities. Um, and while these vulnerabilities are very real, um, so is, uh, secondly, so is the opportunity for tech-driven innovation and resilience. I think one reason why cyber issues, to, to answer an earlier question, should be at the very top of the agenda um, is because, not, not necessarily because of the costs, but because African countries have an awful lot to gain by investing in kind of new technologies and then local technologies, as, as Grace said uh, during one of her kind of, kind of contributions. Um, if data is the new oil, and if, if, if most of what we do increasingly has some cyber dependent element, then it stands to reason that African states who invest in and put digital capabilities at the very top of their political agenda will find themselves in a good, good, good position both to respond to the increasing demands of their citizens, but also to respond to a lot of the threats that we have talked about uh, today. So that's why I think cybersecurity should be uh, at, at the top of the agenda. And then finally, though, the final point I want to make uh, is that while uh, adopting new technology is important, it's also equally important to consider how it is employed, used, and the collective interests African states might have in, in governing its use vis-a-vis -vis international actors, vis-a-vis uh, -vis setting norms of state behavior. Um, I think Grace's work contribution was particularly great. I think she comprehend, comprehensively highlighted how you know, in addition to consideration, the adoption of technology, you need legislation, treaties, strategies, regulations to ensure that it is used um, both to meet citizens' needs and to defend legitimate security interests without provoking repression, political instability, uh, and violence. Um, finally, so on the cyber extremism points, the, the concerns about radicalization, I am glad there was a lot of interest in that. Um, that will actually be the topic of our next webinar, I believe it is on the calendar for May, where we will look at the cyber dimensions of the challenges posed by extremist groups in Africa. Um, and I look forward to hopefully seeing many of you at that conversation then. Uh, until then, I wish everyone a good morning, good afternoon or evening, uh, depending on wherever in the world you are. Thank you.